Hey, this is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. Let's talk for a few minutes about religious division and tribalism. And uh, I guess what uh, thing I should do to start out with is define what do I mean by tribalism? Well, we know what re religious division means. Tribalism is the idea that I've picked a side and I'm going to stick to that side no matter what. No matter the evidence or lack of evidence, I've picked my team and I'm going to stay with my team. And I, I think a great illustration of the existence of tribalism, particularly in American culture, is politics. You think about how, what, you think about how things are going right now in Washington, D.C., and you see a bunch of tribalism. You see votes and impeachment, and you see things going straight down the party line pretty much. These people are tribal. They're dedicated to their side, their point of view, and no amount of evidence or lack of evidence is going to sway them in either direction. That's tribalism. Well, that exact mindset can exist in Christendom, where someone has picked a side, they've picked a, a theology, a belief, a practice, and they're going to stick with their side no matter what. They're going to be tribal about it. Um, in John chapter 7, I think there's a... I don't know if this is a, a good example of tribalism, but it is it is a good example of what I want to spend a few minutes talking about today of um, skepticism in terms of religion, and even to some extent, I guess I would say tribalism, picking a side and sticking with it no matter what. So here in John chapter 7, um, Jesus has decided to stop going in, to certain places uh, because he, his life, they were trying to kill him. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1, he was, he was going to stop going to Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. And uh, so he's in Galilee. But the feast, the, the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And so, you know, as a Jewish male, he would go and celebrate that feast uh, in Jerusalem. So his brothers tell him, and these are his fleshly brothers. These aren't Jewish acquaintances. These are his mother's children. These are Mary's kids. Uh, so John 7, 3, his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. It, it, their statement here, as recorded in the end of verse 4, is interesting. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And just on the face of it, just by reading verse 4, we know that his brothers didn't even believe in him. But... We'd ha we have verse 5 that says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So uh, his brothers are showing skepticism. Um, and you see some division here. Now, this, is, this division is within the family of Jesus, the physical family of Jesus himself, among his own uh, kin. So um, his disciples go on to the feast, uh, verse 10, and then he comes up some time later. Well, there's discussion going on about him because of things that have happened. You go back to John chapter 5 and chapters 5 and 6, and you see miracles that he's been performing and teachings that he's been uh, doing. So there's naturally there's going to be discussion about what's been going on, who Jesus is, and things like this. Um, so they're asking John 7 verse 11, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said no. On the contrary, he deceives the people. So you have here, you have religious division. And I would say to some extent you have tribalism. You've got two sides. He's good. No, he's not good. Howbeit, no one opens, uh, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the question that's asked here in John 7, 15, it's recorded in John 7, 15, it says, The Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? In other words, that word for letters uh, in the Greek uh, comes from the word grama, and it's talking about essentially the, the writings. And uh, how does he know the scripture so well? How does he know these teachings so well since he never went to school anywhere? You know, basically, Jesus, who's your rabbi? Who, what Jewish leader taught you these things? This is the discussion that they're having. And so here's his response. And and this is what what's contained in his response here in just a couple of verses is the cure for religious division and for tribalism. Again, tribalism being I've picked one side, I'm going to stay with my side no matter what. Again, no matter evidence or lack of evidence, I've picked my team and I'm staying there. So 
How does this man know letters having never studied? And so his, his response is, my doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, if anybody wants to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether, now um, the, the King James says here, whether I speak of myself, I prefer the reading of the New King James here. It says, or whether I speak on my own authority. And that's exactly what he's meaning. Am I, are the, the things that I'm teaching, things that I, did those things originate with God? Or have I taken it upon myself to teach these things, to come up with these new doctrines? Um, so he says then in verse 18, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him, now he's now speaking of himself, I'm speak, seeking the glory of him who sent me is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So again, here's, your, here's the cure for religious division and tribalism. So <clears throat> I preach for the Mammoth Spring Church of Christ, and I live in a town that's about a thousand people or so. A couple miles up the road, we have another little town, uh, Thayer, Missouri, two to 3,000 people or so. So a fairly small town. Um, we moved up here from Pensacola, Florida. The, the county we lived in in Pensacola, Florida was pretty large, uh, 300 to 400,000 people within the city of Pensacola itself, 60,000 people. So, And I've lived in bigger places than that, Memphis, outside of Nashville, Tennessee. I've lived in several areas in my life. Um, but, you know, it doesn't matter where you go, whether it's a small town or a big city, and, and not only in the United States of America, but, but all across the world, you see religious division, you see tribalism, um, you see people dedicated to what they believe, what they've been taught, what they practice. Here is the, here is the standard. If we're going to claim to be, as, as Jesus says here in verse 18, if we're going to be seeking the glory of God, which, you know, the Christian is told to do everything to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, I believe verse 31 tells us to do that. Um, then we're going to seek, as it says here, his doctrine. We're, we're, going to, we're not going to speak on our own authority. We're not going to take it upon ourselves to come up with our own doctrine. So you have all this religion division, religious division that exists. And the fact of the matter is it exi existed in the first century. The only cure for religious division, the only way to bring people together in unity is to check their doctrine, what's being taught, what's being practiced. Uh, several years I was having a Bible study with somebody, and this person made a good point. She came from, a, uh, from a, a different religious background. She came from the Baptist background. And so we were talking about churches and teachings and practices, and one thing that she said that, that I've never forgotten. It's a, I guess it's a simple observation, but it stuck with me. She said, not everybody can be right. And we were, again, discussing the differences in teachings and practices in all these churches, and that's a, that's a very accurate statement. Not everybody can be right. Not every church can be right. Not everything that's taught, not everything that's practiced can be right. If, if, what, we, if, if what a person or a church does or teaches does not match up with what the, as it says here in John 7, 17, the doctrine, whether it's from God, if it doesn't match up, then I'm wrong, period. It, you know, it doesn't matter um, what tribe I've picked or what team I've picked or how I was raised. And, you know, some people take their tribalism from that perspective of, well, this is how my family, this is my family's tradition. And I talked about that a little bit Sunday in our sermon here at Mammoth Spring about uh, passing, uh, passing on your faith and how... Faith is not inherited. You, it, each person is responsible to develop his or her own faith. It doesn't come down from your parents, or at least it shouldn't, um, because, you know, our parents can be wrong. But anyway, so listen again to John seven seventeen, and we'll talk about a couple things. If anyone wills to do his will, and again, that is God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. And again, whether I've taken it upon myself to come up with this doctrine. So, Obviously, the primary question then is, why does religious division exist? Well, when you look in the, in the page of the New Testament, that, the answers come pretty, uh, pretty straightforward, pretty clearly. Uh, I think, for example, the first, you can read the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians, and Paul addresses it in several different ways. Uh, division was within that local church there in the city of Corinth for one reason, because the, the members of that church were saying, well, 
this guy baptized me or this guy baptized me. And so they were split among that one group based on who had baptized them. And so that's why Paul said, um, uh, I thank God that I only baptized Crispin and Gaius and the household of Stephanus. Besides that, he said, I don't know who I baptized because Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. That's basically, that's 1 Corinthians 1, verses 14 to 17. And so he, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't baptizing in his own name. Of course, he was baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, but it wasn't in an effort to get followers after himself. But, so that's one way that people can get uh, people can become divided and tribal within even a local congregation. But then another another reason that's listed for us in Scripture, uh, well, listed, that's that's discussed in Scripture, this is over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and uh, beginning in verse 10, the Apostle Paul writing, listen to what he says. He says, And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because, and you're going to see this phrase a couple of times here, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, for the reason of they didn't, they didn't love the truth. So for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. If you don't believe God's truth, you're apt to believe anything. And so he goes on to say in verse 12, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that word pleasure in 2 Thessalonians 2.12 means to, to have a preference for. I prefer this instead of the truth. And the reason that some people uh, prefer unrighteousness goes back up to the end of verse 10 because they, didn't, they don't love the truth. And so they're willing to accept just anything. Uh, Paul talks similarly in Galatians chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9 that the churches of Galatia were turning away from the truth, and they were going with a different gospel, which he said, listen, even if an angel from heaven preaches a, something different than what you've received, they're, they're wrong. Let them be accursed. So uh, those are just a couple of reasons. Um, you know, who taught me? Who baptized me? Well, I'm going to follow that guy. Or a person doesn't love the truth. They just, they They've been trained, they've been brought up in a certain way, and therefore they believe it. I did it several years ago. I did a study, and I've got it over here, uh, over here on my shelf. I, I did a study several years ago on uh, denominational doctrines and took a careful examination of all the different teachings that, that these churches, um, that we see, again, in, in small towns and big cities, that they're involved in things that they teach and believe, and I went to their websites. I printed these things out so I would know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to just say things for the sake of saying them. I want to know what I'm talking about, what's being discussed. So I printed out these documents. These, uh, I'm just putting it up here so you can see the, the thickness of this. These are basically, um, well, the first group is here, just for example, on the Lutheran Church, the beliefs and practices of the Lutheran Church. And uh, it's, it's quite a lengthy document. Um, and I went through every major denomination and examined their teachings, um, where they started, you know, where these churches started, who started these organi organizations and all this kind of stuff. And it just goes to show you what, you know, what the Bible says that people, some people don't love the truth. Some people are following individuals. And uh, so therefore we have religious division and we have, just like we do in politics, we have this idea of tribalism. So looking back at John 7 and verse 17, this needs to be the standard of any individual person or any uh, church group. If anyone wills to do his will, he will know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. So uh, if, if what I teach and practice is not, if I can't find it in the Bible, then, it, then I know it's not from God. I mean, that's just the end of that conversation. There's, we have, it's like Jude tells us in Jude verse 3, the faith has been once and for all delivered. We, we have here what God wants us to do and to know. It's like Peter says in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, we have all things that pertain to life and godliness uh, through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue. We can know these things and we have all things uh, that, that pertain to life and godliness. So my doctrine, whether it's from God or from myself, my own authority, my own initiative, that can easily be known and recognized by compare, again by comparing what I do or believe with what the Bible says. 
and you know we could go down any number of of uh, roads examining this concept. Uh, I've done several videos over the past few months dealing with very specific things. Uh, one of the last videos I did was on Romans 10, 9, and 10. I actually did a two-parter on how that verse, those two verses are misused by so many people to say, um, all you have to do is believe and confess. Well, when you compare that doctrine with Scripture, um, it, it falls it just falls short of what the Bible says a person must do to be saved. So uh, something I was doing, reading, um, doing my daily Bible reading. You know, if you read about nine to ten chapters of your New Testament a day, you can read through your New Testament in a month. So in one year, if you take the time, you can read your New Testament through 12 times. So a common doctrine in the denominational world is you... As Romans 10, 9, and 10 says, you believe with your heart and you make a confession and you'll be saved, which it's not what Paul's talking about there. And I covered it in those videos, so I'm not going to cover it today. So, let, But let's compare that doctrine with what Scripture actually says. So if all I have to do is believe and confess to be saved, okay, one passage of Scripture that I mentioned was James chapter 2 and verse 19, where James says, you believe that there is one God, you do well. The devils also believe, the demons also believe and tremble. So they they know very well who Jesus Christ is. So as I was doing my daily Bible reading today, it was in Matthew chapter 8. And uh, so listen to Matthew chapter 8, beginning in verse 28, talking about Jesus and his, his uh, ministry. It said, when he, uh, when he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, What have we to do with you? Jesus, you son of God, have you come here to torment us before the time? So here's a, a prime example of what, what I was saying the other day. The demons believe, and they even make the confession, Jesus, you are the son of God. They knew who he was. They made the confession. So that's just an illustration of what I'm saying here, of you will know the doctrine, whether it's from God or I'm speaking on my own authority. Uh, and the way people use certain passages of Scripture contradicts will contradict other passages of scripture another great example uh, I, I was mentioning earlier uh, denominational doctrines another great example of this is Romans in Romans chapter 3 uh, and looking back into a little bit of church history here think of the the reformer Martin Luther Martin Luther was a initially he was a Roman Catholic but when he began to see the abuses of Catholicism and it was per, in particular I would say it was the, the sale of indulgences. Um, and it's pretty interesting to do a study on the history of that, the sales of indulgences that the church, the Catholic church was doing. They had one very effective salesman by the name of John Tetzel. Uh, so Martin Luther hears and sees all this, and he knows that this the, the sale of these indulgences, essentially fu purchasing forgiveness for future sins, wasn't right. And he also understood that Roman Catholicism teaches basically a, a um, uh, salvation earned by works. So he's trying to break away from that during the Reformation period. Uh, one of the things he does is translate Scripture into his language. So when he's translating Romans chapter 3, I'll read to you verse 28. Uh, it says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Well, when he translated that, he translated it like this. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith alone, apart from the deeds of the law. So he took it upon himself, again, having seen the abuses and the false teaching of Catholicism, took it upon himself to when he translated Scripture, he was going to add a word in there to get away from the uh, works-based salvation. I can earn my way to heaven. And he goes to the other extreme and adds a word into Scripture saying that man's saved by faith only. That's just another example of... Uh, another cause of religious division and tribalism, because a lot of people hold to that doctrine today. Um, just for example, I had a discussion recently with an individual who, talking about salvation, uses Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. So this is what that passage says. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Well, this person used that verse to say, see, you're saved by faith alone through grace alone. Well, that <laughs> it doesn't say that. Uh, no passage in Scripture says that. The, the, in fact, if, if salvation is by grace alone, 
then it's by nothing else. Faith would be left out. If it's truly by grace alone, then it can't be by faith or anything else. But if it's by faith alone, then you have to leave grace out. So people hold to these doctrines and they get, and again, they take their side, they get on their team and they've got these beliefs, this, again, this tribalism, and they're unwilling to look at anything else. They'll have this one passage and these, these conversations that I've had with these people in terms of Romans 10, Ephesians 2, they don't want to look at any other passage. Uh, they'll just keep coming. Yeah, but it says this, but it says this. That is a prime example of tribalism. What we have to be willing to do and, and myself included, is we have got to be willing to examine what we believe ourselves and not just swallow what we're taught. Um, I was over in Second Thessalonians just a minute ago, and I wanted to look at another verse right, right near there in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Um, we've got to be willing to examine what we believe. You know, we can be wrong. But here, here again is the thing, what Jesus said there in John 7, 17. You can know the doctrine, whether it's from God or whether you're speaking on your own authority. So over here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, um, well, I'll just begin reading in verse 3. Paul's writing to Timothy. He says, as, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. Now listen to 1 Timothy 1 beginning in verse 6. From which some have strayed, that is from a, a good conscience and sincere faith, some have strayed, having turned aside to idle talk, and then this, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things whereof they affirm. That word understanding there means perception. They, they, can't, they can't even see the, um, the uh, consequences of what they're saying or what they're teaching or believing. And then he says, um, understanding neither what they say nor the things whereof they affirm, or the things which they affirm. To affirm here means to, to, be, to, as, to assure firmly, to, to make your thoughts known. They don't Again, they don't fully comprehend the um, oh the the complexities of what they're saying. Okay, just again by way of a simple example, grace alone through faith alone. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere, not in the Old Testament, not in the New Testament. That's a doctrine that does not come from God. Um, this doctrine that you're saved at the point of making the confession is not taught anywhere in Scripture. Uh, it's it, verses are twisted, you know, and Peter talks about that in second Peter three sixteen. Some people will twist the scriptures to their own destruction, but they, these people who, who, who pick a side and they're not willing to examine, um, a word that's used sometimes is scrutinize. They're not willing to do that with themselves, with what they believe. They understand neither what they say, nor the things which they affirm. Um, and here's the thing. If, if what I believe as an individual uh, in terms of religion and uh, Christianity, in terms of faith, if what I believe and practice is not found in the Bible, the only other option is that it came from man. So and that's, there, there's no third option there. So um, who's right or who's wrong? And, and if I'm wrong, am I willing and am I honest enough to examine what I have held to, what I have taught and believed uh, and practiced, am I honest enough to then change it if it's not, if, if I can't find it in Scripture? That's the challenge. That, and that, that's what, um, ha having a mindset, having that attitude of, again, tribalism, I know I've used that word a couple of times, but having the mindset of tri uh, tribalism will prevent a person from examining what they do believe. Because, again, their mind's made up. And, and specifically in terms of church, in terms of religion, the, the, a typical response is, well, that's how I was raised. Um, we, could, we could consider that in a couple of different ways. Well, what if you were raised by, um, by parents who were alcoholics? That's going to have a lingering effect on you, but are you, are you willing to continue in that kind of a, 
lifestyle without any self-examination, without looking at the consequences of what you're doing? Well, of course not. A lot of people would look at that and say, well, I need, I need to change. You know, this is a pattern that's gone on in my family. I need to examine myself and make some changes here. And a, a lot of people are honest enough to do that. The sad thing is, though, when it comes to religion, a lot of people are not honest enough to do that. So many people, and I think a lot of it goes back to the heart and the idea of sincerity. And I, Maybe that's what the problem is. A lot of people go back to that. Well, I really believe this is the right thing to do or the right, the right way to believe or worship. But think about that question that I presented earlier that somebody presented me, or that statement, not necessarily a question. Again, considering all the different churches that exist and all the different teachings that go on, um, all the different ways that people worship, not everybody can be right. It, and it just comes down to that point. Not everybody can be right. You know, when, when Jesus was praying for, for his disciples and ultimately for us, so it's recorded in John 17, verses 20 and 21, in that prayer, he says very specifically that he, his desire was for his followers to be one as he and the Father were one, that we may be one in them. <clears throat> his desire was for complete unity among his followers. And when you, again, when you look around the religious world today, we have anything but unity. Um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's really, to me, it's crazy how much division there is and how many different teachings and practices there are in the name of Christ that, that are just complete. If you were to, to set two assemblies together from different faiths and you just watch what they did side by side and listen to what they taught, it would be so contradictory in so many different instances and some would worship this way with these these things going on, and and you you would have this other group that would be doing things complete completely differently. Both of them can't be right. Um, am I honest enough then to go to Scripture and search out for what is right? You know, does the Bible talk about the church? Well, obviously it does. Uh, does it talk about how the that first church, you know, starting there in Jerusalem, how it worshiped and what it taught and what it believed and, and what it, um, how it reached out to others. And yet we have a record of all of that. That's the book of Acts is the, the history of the um, establishment and the propagation of the church throughout the Roman Empire. And if we want to be that church, then we need to do what they did and how they did it. It's, it's really just that simple. It's not as complicated as people make it seem. So again, going back here into John, um, John chapter seven, it's uh, I think it illustrates how difficult this can be if people are not um, honest. See, up to this point, when we get here to John chapter seven, again, Jesus has been performing miracles. He's been, in fact, when you look back <clears throat> in uh, John chapter six, he's fed the five thousand. You go back to John chapter five, and the first oh. Oh, the first 15 verses of John chapter 5, he heals a person. So he's been, he's been performing these works that God sent him to do. The, so the evidence is there. But as it says in John chapter 7 and verse 5, even his brothers didn't believe in him. So I would say you have some dishonesty here among his own flesh and blood. Because even in the face of all the evidence that he had provided, they still didn't believe. And then, of course, you have down there in John 7 verses 14 and 15, you have the discussion going on in Jerusalem. Well, uh, uh, verse 12, I guess. Some say he's good. No, he's con he, on the contrary, he's deceptive. He's deceiving the people. So there's, there's this division that existed even in the life of Christ, even in the face of all the evidence that he provided. That's, that's religious division. That's tribalism. And it, it uh, still exists today. But here's the key. My doctrine, John seven sixteen, is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will... And the, the New International Version there, John 7, 17, says if anyone chooses to do his will. And there it is. There's the key. We've got to choose to do what God wants. It's not about how I was raised or a particular top doctrine that I prefer. Um, we've got to choose to do his will. He shall know concerning the doctrine, whether, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. So... Um, 
That's that's the only cure for religious division and tribalism. Don't pick your team and stay on your team because you've always been on that team, uh, rel religiously speaking. Examine what you do and what you believe in light of Scripture, not in light of what you think you should do or uh, should believe. You know, Paul did that, and he, he even talks about that in Acts chapter 23 and verse 1 specifically says it. He said, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Well, you're, having a good conscience doesn't necessarily make you right because your, your conscience can be trained incorrectly. So um, that, my, my conscience or what I feel is not the standard of right and wrong. Again, John 7, 17, there's two options. The doctrine is either from God or I'm speaking on my own authority. Compare it with Scripture, see what the Bible says, and be honest enough to, to uh, if need be, make a change. And um, yeah, go, going back to what Paul wrote there in 1 Timothy chapter 1, sometimes people desire to be teachers, but they don't understand what they're saying, and they really don't understand what they're affirming when they say what they're saying. Uh, the good thing is you can. You can know what's right. You can know uh, God's doctrine because it's been laid out for us in Scripture. Paul even talks about that in Romans chapter 6, that the Roman church had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that had been delivered to them, and having been set free from sin, they became the servants of righteousness. Well, that same thing can happen with us today, but there again, we have to examine it. We have to look into Scripture and see what it would have us to do. So I appreciate all of you who are here on the live stream, and uh, if you ever have any questions about anything I say, uh, feel free to put those questions in the comments or send me a private message. But again, this is uh, Barry O'Dell at the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. And thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next video.